Our next reader is Oliver De La Paz, uh, MFA 1998, Oliver? Yes? 99, okay. I heard Oliver read poems a few years ago that I could only describe as fabulous, literally, like allegories, all organized around the metaphor of a boy in a labyrinth. In addition to being the author of such spellbinding poetry, Oliver is the co, actually vice president of AWP, the, on the, of the board of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, where I got to know him as an able and witty colleague. And he is co-chair of the advisory board for Kundaman, an organization devoted to promoting Asian American poetry. As you'll soon see, he is personally gracious and full of grace. Thank you. Can you hear me? It's such an honor to be back. Um, had a lot of good memories here. And, you know, I, I think that my writing is the sum of all the good teaching that I received here. And so I want to thank my teachers, Alberto Rios, Norman Duby, Becky and Fritz Goldberg, Melissa, who's here, Melissa Pritchard, um, Carla, of course, it's a wonderful teacher for me, Janine. And uh, I've got, I'm missing somebody, and I'm going to probably be in real trouble. Um, <coughs> did I name them all? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start with uh, some new work, and then I'm going to read some things that I wrote when I was in the program. This first poem is an ekphrastic poem. It's based on an image that I saw in the Mütter Museum, uh, and it is a mummy of a girl. It's entitled... Nocturne with the mummified remains of a girl pulled from a bog after the Ectved girl. It is a difficult thing. The skin and the skin's new form and how what's missing grows large as if the source of something that once drew warmth and poured out the sack of the body filled with sawdust and was sewn up. The knot of fingers folded into a bramble fence. Soft tissue stiffened to the texture of a ballet slipper. And the elegant foot somehow gone from its housing. Here is where the slippage of selves floats its weight into the deep swales of summer. The nights are warm and the sphagnum hushes every sound. Its density troubles the landscape with thatches, pockets, small underpinnings, indeterminacies. The bowl at the center of the bog, deep enough to cover a man from head to toe in sludge. And the frogs call their soft songs to find each other in the fog. The frogs stir from deep within the mist and confuse themselves with their sound. A singular hum, a singular engine with the sole industry of determining love, 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 they say. Their white throats fire their outbursts. It's easy to lose yourself among the singers and the dark. And this is how to begin. Softly, the foot presses against the wet, dark peat. Softly, the curses of breath rise up from the breastbone, and to the mouth, the acidic grit of bog's dark jade. Into the nose, the terrible intercessions of muck rushing past the septum, into the throat, and down, further down. And from the mind, bright lariats, of holly around a table, the faces of family, heavenward, lit by the last auroras of something, a memory pressed against a monstrous glass. It is here where the body resides, 
and the skin empties its contents, the skin hardened into a pouch. The pouch, which was once a girl, holds nothing but the tragedy of love, the tragedy of beautiful breaths taken and swallowed and sung. So I'm going to read um, a poem that I wrote in Tito's class. <laughs> and one of the assignments that he gave us in magical realism <laughs> was to write something different. And I had, I had written a long poem, which was really a terrible poem. Um, and this was a really good assignment for me at the time. Um, so I started writing these little vignettes. Uh, the poem is entitled The Fourth Madonna, and in Lourdes, Lourdes in France, um, one of the ideas that they have there is that you can collect these little plastic statues of the Virgin Mary, and that uh, they have the holy water from the fountain of the grotto has the power to heal you. Um, and being a Filipino Catholic, we probably accumulated 20 of these little statues. Um, <laughs> So they were everywhere in our house. This is entitled The Fourth Madonna. She's a statuette the size of a child's thumb, and the boy thinks she speaks to him. Fidelito hides her from the television's aquarium light, fearing that she may drown the way Domingo sinks below the surface of the cathode. She appears in the bathroom on top of the toilet's water tank to prove that she's wholly unafraid. She has been washed in Fidelito's pant pocket four times, a miracle that her paint has not chipped. She has appeared in wars with other statuettes her same size. The green army men freeze, toppling over when they see her. At night, she swings from a string hung from the ceiling of the boy's room, circling with the propeller blade of the ceiling fan. She blesses the room with her blue arcs. So I thank Tito for that, that assignment. And another assignment, this is from another class. This is from Becky Ann and Melissa's class on the erotic image. And I have to tell you that no class terrified me more than that class because, you know, we were like, damn, is that erotic? No, it's not erotic. And, you know, we would have these conversations in class. And, you know, my, my dear friend Sue Elspeth was like, that's not a sexy poem. Are you sure? It feels like a sexy poem. I feel like I'm coming out of my body here, that this is really a stretch for me. And so I found out that I'm just not a sexy poet, but, um, but I can write romantic poems. So this is a poem that kind of was written slantwise, slantwise from the erotic image poem that Melissa and Becky and taught years ago. Obad with scorpions and monsoon. Little sleeper. I mentioned the scorpions were thoughtless in the rain as they swam down the length of the green skins to the flood, eel-like with furious tails. Earlier, the sky had turned a mustard color, proving that August and its rains would soon bathe the desert, making the whole thing become a dark scar. Water caused the scorpions to shelter against the cacti spikes. The yellow-brown exoskeleton click-clacked as they climbed atop one another, preserving themselves. Of course, the cacti were indifferent to all this, as are you when you are sleeping. How calamitous it would be to miss your slumber. I know it's early, and daybreak is just another accident, sufficient for us to snub in our weariness. Listen, the monsoon's relentless. The lightning leaps from cloud to cloud in whole valleys. It looks like a flashlight shined on the rafters of the firmament. What an astonishment to see the desert take on water in starved portions. However, your god is asleep, 
and it's difficult to admonish one so calm and white. You're like a Chalcedony street on a Sunday. Listen, this is hard, and I'd hate to wake you just to tell you how the scorpions hold each other by their pinchers until dawn, spiraling down the saguaros in amber rosettes. Hush, there are torrents above our heads, and sleep is a phantom thing for us to hold. So thank you, Becky Ann and Melissa. I tried sexy, but I just don't do sexy. <laughs> I'm gonna jump ahead. This, uh, this is my latest book, uh, Post Subject Fable, and um, it is all prose poems, which Becky Ann introduced me to. Um, and ever since her class, I've been haunted by prose poems. So thank you, Becky Ann, again. Um, and it, it's basically a series of epistolary poems um, that, are, oops, that are all addressed to empire. Um, and it opens with a quote um, that I want to tell you because it kind of informs the book. And I'm only going to read one poem, so here I am talking about all this stuff. Uh, it's by Henry L. Stimson. And the quote is, gentlemen do not read each other's mail. And why Henry Stimson was the governor general of the Philippines under uh, American op occupation. And he was famous for his um, distaste of um, the spy craft. But of course, in World War II, he was instrumental in the spy craft and the enigma um, you know, um, episode where um, they deciphered the Nazi code. So Henry Stimson. This is all to say that I have one poem that's, I'm going to read. <laughs> Dear Empire, these are your jellyfish. They are the artist's obsession. The way their forms are taken by tides, pulled towards the shore or towards some unknowing place. Our beaches are cursed by thousands of these little ghosts. Yet the artist fills her canvases with their clear and brilliant orbs. Occasional tendrils seem to slide off the edge. Their little hidden fires, their little underneath parts papering the dark. To have a mind is hers. To have an eye that understands the little shocks beneath. To consider that these ghosts have such an edge such a sting. All right. I'm going to read two more poems. Um, I have a story about Norman. Norman Duby was my thesis uh, reader, and it was on the tail end of my time at ASU, and he would give me these really elaborate assignments. Um, one of the assignments um, was to write a poem with this block of ice that held a deer's heart inside of it, and that it fell off this cart into the street and then started melting slowly in the street. And I went home with this assignment, and I'm like, So I have to do that sometime. <laughs> I have to write that poem. <laughs> but, but I want to thank Norman, who I don't think he's here tonight, um, whose incredible creative spirit has helped me to continue writing. Um, that, that if it weren't for his exquisite imagination and how he modeled it for me, I wouldn't have written more books. You know, honestly. Um, plus, you know, um, gosh, you know, he's, he's got these crazy assignments that I still give myself today. All this to say, this poem has nothing to do with that. I live in uh, Washington, and I, for a time, lived um, in Deming near the Department of Natural Resources um, land trust. And uh, there's a swath of 40 acres that my uh, house was adjacent to. And prior to buying the house, it was a full forest. And then after I bought the house, they clear cut it. I was really bad. Um, but uh, it 
generated this poem. Meditation with smoke and flowers. It is Monday, and I'm not thinking of myself. My son asleep in his stroller, and the dark conifers holding nothing but their scent. I'm walking him to the place where loggers have cleared 30 acres, leaving only ash and stripped tree limbs. The light now comes to the places once dark, and now wildflowers, where once the moss grew thick and complete. The flame of something around the corner, and I'm thinking of the wild tiger lilies that line this gravel road below my house how they clump together, their stems bent down from the weight of their flowers, how mouth-like they are, and how their speechlessness makes the road quieter. Each flower is a surprise, like the flaming tip of cigarettes in the dark. I think that the road cannot handle all these mouths, though there are mythologies held in check by the tongue. Like the story my father told me about his father in wartime and how his own father forced him with the threat of a beating to go under the house for a cigarette from a Japanese foot soldier bunkered down. I can see my father's small trembling hand outstretched to this man whose face is mud-caked, smelling slightly of fire and lubricant for his rifle. The smoke from the soldier's own cigarette takes the shape of the underside of the house, and I imagine my father can hear his own father above him pacing. But this road now is free of smoke. The logging trucks have taken off for the night and the tree remnants have smoldered into nothing but charcoal. The wreck of everything is a vacuum. So too the wreck of a village after war or the floorboards above a son's head in fear of his own father. Here though, there is nothing to fear. The wheels of the stroller on gravel is the only sound and the idleness of the excavation trucks hearkens to someone asleep in the uneasy dark. No, I'm not thinking of myself. I'm thinking of an agreement my father must have made with himself years ago when the houses were burning into bright bouquets in the nighttime. How perhaps he swore he would not beat his own son, while somewhere in the afterlife, His own father smokes and paces. Perhaps there are no flowers in that place. Perhaps the lone soldier, through with hiding, crawled out after the guns had stopped and dusted himself off, the sun striking his face with its unreasonable light. I'm thinking of my son asleep and of the wild tiger lilies how frail they are in this new light, why they come, why they spring up unannounced as suddenly as the promises we make with ourselves when we are young. And I'm going to end with this poem um, in defense of small towns. Um, This is for Marco. In defense of small towns. When I look at it, It's simple, really. I hated life there. September once filled with animal deaths and toughened hay, and the smells of fall were boiled down beets and potatoes, or the farmhands' breeches smeared with oil and diesel as they rode into town, dusty and pissed. The radio station split time between metal and Tejano, and the only action happened on Friday nights where the high school football team gave everyone a chance at forgiveness. The town left no room for novelty or change. And the sheriff knew everyone's son, and despite that, we'd cruise up and down the avenues, switching between brake and gear shift. We'd fight 
and spit chew into big gulp cups and have our hearts broken nightly. In that town, I learned to fire a shotgun at nine and wring a chicken's neck with one hand by twirling the bird and whipping it straight like a towel. But I loved the place once. Everything was blonde and cracked, and the irrigation ditches stretched to the end of the earth. You could ride on a bicycle and see clearly the outline of every leaf or catch on the streets each word of a neighbor's argument. Nothing could happen there, and if I willed it, the place would have me slipping over its rocks into the river with the sugar plant's steam, or signing papers at a storefront army desk buttoned up with medallions and a crew cut eyeing the next recruits. If I learned anything, it's that I could be anywhere, staring at a hunk of asphalt or listening to the clap of billiard balls against each other in a bar and hear my name. Indifference now? Some. I shook loose, but that isn't the whole story. The fact is I'm still in love. And when I wake up, I watch my son yawn, and my mind turns his upswept hair into corn stalks at the edge of a field. Stillness is an acre, and his body idles deep like heavy machinery. I want to take him back there, to the small town of my youth, and hold the book of wildflowers open for him, and look. I want him to know the colors of horses, to run with a cattail in his hand and watch as its seeds fly weightless, as though nothing mattered, as though the little things we tell ourselves about our pasts stay there, rising slightly and just out of reach. Thank you.